barely remember where the book of Isaiah is. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm just so messed up in the Holy Ghost right now. But let me read a passage for you um, that God was putting on my heart in the prayer circle, in the fire circle last night. Hallelujah. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. And the Lord says this, Remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. For behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Do you not know it? Do you not discern it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the deserts. Guys, I'm telling you, in a matter of minutes, the Lord is snapping a plumb line. Yeah. In the matter of minutes, God is setting things in motion in the Kairos timeline. In a matter of minutes, God is about to bring a shout that's going to change everything. We are stepping, we have stepped in this very moment out of the Kronos and into the Kairos. Hallelujah. This night, God is setting us free from this. And he's bringing us into his divinely inspired timing. I heard the Lord say a moment ago, people in this body are going to begin translating. People in this body are going to begin stepping out of one door and stepping into another in very strategic places. Guys, I'm going to tell you, I was in the secret place lost in the Lord one morning this week. And I said, Lord, I want you to translate me to a meeting of the underground church in China. Oh. Lord, to release a word that you want released. I didn't hear the Lord say anything back. But when I, just before service started tonight, I walked down the foyer hallway and all of a sudden the utility closet door opens up and Geo comes out of it. <laughs> I'm not sure what in the world he was doing in that closet, but Geo just comes out. And Geo looks at me and he goes, I just translated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Now he was joking. But I heard the Lord say translate during praise and worship. Yeah. Guys, we're coming into the new realms and new dimensions in the spirit. There is a unique glory anointing in this room. Let me remind you, the Lord says that we are in a shift. We talk about the dispensations. Let's talk about the dimensions. The Lord says we're shifting out of the dimension of the anointing and into the dimension of the glory. And that's going to change everything. And God is looking for churches who are willing to shift into the dimension of the glory. Because when that happens, the preacher doesn't preach. When that happens, come on. The guys don't take an offering. They don't pass the plate. When that happens, the heavy, weighty glory of God comes in and shifts the atmosphere. And everybody is on their face before the Lord in the holy kavod of the Lord God Almighty. And everything begins to change. Yeah, thank you, Lord. How many want to see the glory? Yes. Yeah. Lord, I'm not going to go unless you go with me. Lord, show me your glory. Lord Jesus, we cry out tonight if you call us your friends. And you did in John 15. Lord, show us your glory. I just decree and declare the glory portal of the Lord is opening up over this region in Jesus' name. Open glory portal. Open glory portal. Open glory portal. Over this region. Open up. In the name of Jesus. How many are ready to go to a place in the Lord where there's no returning? How many are ready to go to a place in the Lord where you aren't even going to recognize yourself? Because of the realms he's going to shift you into. How many are ready and willing to go to that place where we say, Lord, I will drink of the cup. I will drink of the cup this night. 
Not my will, but thine be done. In Jesus' name, amen. I just heard the Holy Spirit say, expect things to be different. <laughs> expect things to be different. Expect things to be different. We told the Lord Jesus at the, night, the start of the service this night, we just said, Lord, we've come expecting. We put a draw in, in the realm of the Spirit. And could you feel the glory pouring out as we were singing? Open the scrolls, break the seals, worthy one. It was like the Lord peeled the second heaven out of the way. And it was like we were in the throne room of God. Hallelujah. And I felt a fire. Okay. Hey. Coming from the Lord. Whoo! That was mighty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ho! Ho! Oh, oh, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would release the manifestations of the glory in this room tonight to bring glory and honor to the glorious one, the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hey, hey! Oh, more, Lord. Oh. And there's people going to bars all over this region tonight to get messed up. Okay. Wow. Wow. <laughs> There's nothing to what's going on in this room right now. And Lord Jesus, as the broadcast is going on right now, may your glory fill every room. Lord, that's watching this broadcast. Lord, may your glory fill every vehicle. Lord, may your glory fill every home. Lord, where this is going. Oh, oh, release your glory, Lord. Glory, glory, glory. Oh, thank you, Lord. And Lord, even those that are watching tonight, not because, oh, they really want to see you move in this place, but they're watching to see what they can see. Lord, may you release your glory over them tonight. May you touch them tonight, Lord. Lord Jesus, we speak of blinding of the eyes of the seers of the enemy tonight. And Lord Jesus, we ask that you would open up the eyes of our hearts in this place today so that we can see you. Lord, we want to see you high and lifted up. And your train filled the temple. Lord, we want to see the wheel within the wheel within the wheel. You know, I was reading, oh, in Ezekiel this morning, and Ezekiel has these encounters with God. And when he sees God, specifically the Lord Jesus, hallelujah, he sees one that looks like a man, but the top half of his body down to his belt line looks like molten metal shining and glowing in red and orange and amber. But then from the waistline down when he sees Jesus, all he sees is fire. Ooh. And the glory of the Lord like a rainbow is all around him. That's how he sees the Lord several times. In the book, oh, the Ezekiel, the glory is coming. Oh, oh, hallelujah, the Lord is coming. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Get ready for encounters. Get ready to see the fire of his glory and the glory of his fire. Oh, get ready to experience Jesus like never before. Yeah. The Lord says, this is the year 2023 where I'm going to break my people loose from the spirit of religion yeah. through divine encounter yeah. with me. I'm going to ruin them in my presence. Yeah. The Lord says, this is the year that we will know that he is God like no other year before. This is the year where he's going to show himself to the nations. This is the year where he's going to be seen. The Lord says, many of my people have cried out, where are you, God? 
Why aren't you moving? Why are you remaining still while all these things are going on in my life and in my region, my neighborhood, my nation, Ukraine and the earth? The Lord says, the people have cried out and said, Lord, where are you? The Lord says in 2023, very early in the new year, he will arise from his throne and we will see him. And no one is going to ask, where is Jesus? Because we will see Jesus walking in the streets. We will see Jesus pouring out his glory. The, the lost and dying world will see Jesus manifest through his bride. This is going to be the year to see Jesus. This is also going to be the year where the Lord snaps a plumb line. Where he separates the wheat from the chaff. Where the Lord God begins to shift and we're either going to shift with him or we're going to miss the shift. The Lord said this is the year where we must be in alignment with him. Because if we're not in alignment with him, we're going to miss what he's about to do. Amen. Guys, this is a year like no other. And the Lord says, I want you to walk in a spirit of belief tonight. The Lord says, I want you to stir up your faith. He says, I don't want you to just think, oh, hallelujah, that... that who, that my servant who's speaking these things is just trying to get you excited and get you pumped up. And by the end of the year, you're going to wonder why didn't things happen the way he said they would happen. The Lord says, I want you to walk in anointing of belief. He says, I want you to believe that I am and I'm the rewarder of those who diligently seek me. Who? The Lord says, remember in Matthew 13 when I went into my hometown and there was such a spirit of religion and unbelief that I could do very few miracles, the Lord said. I believe it's about verse 58. The Lord is saying the things that he's speaking in this room tonight, he wants us to lay hold of them standing on the bridge of faith. Hallelujah. The Lord says to remind this body tonight that faith comes by hearing. and hearing by the Lord says, I want you to take close to your heart, draw near to your heart tonight. Everything I'm speaking, the Lord says. And the Lord is speaking through his word tonight. The Lord's going to speak from his pulpit tonight. The Lord's been speaking during praise and worship tonight. The Lord is going to be speaking all night long. Have your prophetic notebook handy. The Lord says, this is your breakthrough year. The Lord said, this is the year I'm releasing the anointing over you that breaks the yoke. The Lord said, this is the year where all these things you've asked me to deliver you from and all these things that have been tripping you up. The Lord says, all these roadblocks. The Lord says, all these stumbling blocks. This is the year where if you get in alignment with me, I'm going to move them out of the way. Yes, Lord. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Yes, amen. Lord says, some of you have been crying out for deliverance. I'm the deliverer. And you will see me as your deliverer this year. The Lord said, this is the year where all the names that we see for the Lord in the Old Testament, we're going to see him in those covenant names. We're going to see him as Jehovah Jireh. We're going to see him as Jehovah Nisi. We're going to see him as Jehovah Rapha. We're going to see him as Jehovah Sidkenu. We're going to see him as Jehovah Makedesh. This is the year to see the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Earlier in this decade, we've been in the years of the mouth, the years of pay. But the Lord says we're going to go from pay to hey in him. And we're going to see, the Lord says, like never before. We're going to go from speaking to seeing what we've been speaking manifest. Be careful what you speak. Be careful what you speak because God is putting an anointing on your mouth for manifestation of what you speak. Amen. Good and evil. The Lord said, this is the year where I want to put a bit in your mouth. This is not an easy word. The Lord said, this is the year I want to put a bit in the mouth of my bride. That bit will allow me to move her where I want her to go. And that bit will allow her to only say what I want her to say. And when she goes to say something that she should not, I will pull back on those reins. 
This is a year of deeper relationship, deeper accountability with Jesus. This is a year where he wants total reign over every area of your life. And the Lord says if we will give him whoo, rulership of our lives, we're going to see him establish the kingdom yeah. here on earth. Yeah. But he says, don't forget, I'm a spirit being and I need my bride to work through. If you won't, I can't. Yeah. How many are hearing what the Lord is saying? Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hmm. One quick story and then Oh, Josiah is going to come and minister from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Some of you have maybe heard me say this before, but Holy Spirit just brought this back into my mind. And he said to just tell the story of the body. This is a true story. But there was a pastor like myself who was bivocational a few years back, <coughs> a few decades back actually now. And so he worked full time and he pastored <coughs> outside of work. And he was working at an automotive plant. And at this automotive plant, he worked in the area where he worked was where they were putting rims on the tires or tires on the rims that they were going to put on the vehicles. And so he's working one morning and he goes out to lunch. At lunchtime, he comes back and in his area, there's all kinds of people crowded around. And he's like, what in the world is going on? So he presses through to see what's happened, and he realized the guy that works right next to him, who was inexperienced with the tire machine, didn't follow all the safety protocols, and the rim ended up flying off of that machine and caving his entire head in, and he's laying there on the ground. And everybody's all around him panicking and not knowing what to do. So he begins to pray in tongues. And all of a sudden the Lord says, I want you to raise him from the dead. The guy was dead and there was a hundred people standing around looking at this guy. His entire skull is caved in. And he's just laying there. And, he, and the guy, the pastor says to the Lord, I can't do that. And the Lord says to him, you can't, but I can. Mm -hmm. But I can only do it through you. So he said, okay, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? He said, give me control. And so he gives the Lord control. And all of a sudden, he feels the Spirit of God thrust him through the remainder of the crowd right down to where that guy lays on the ground. There's blood and all kinds of things laying right there. And the Lord takes his hands and spreads them out and asks him, touch the ground where the border of the blood is from this guy and yell out, in the name of Jesus! And he said, all of a sudden, like something out of a Hollywood movie, he said, all of a sudden, the blood and everything does this. It comes back into this guy's head, and he sits up, and he looks at everybody, and he goes, what's everybody looking at? God did a creative miracle right there. And then that pastor said, okay, is there anybody here that wants to know Jesus? <laughs> How many know that's the way Jesus did it? He did miracles and miracles stirred people to believe. And then he led them. Amen? He led them to himself. He said, I desire that all men would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. The Lord says, this is the year as we fall in love with him and yield to him and yield our mouths to him. The Lord says, we're going to see signs, wonders, and miracles birthed out of intimacy with Jesus in the secret place. Then you're asking, Lord, why aren't we seeing signs, wonders, and miracles? The Lord says, it's because you're not getting them in the, in the secret place and seeking my face. The Lord says, it's because my church is not fasting and praying. It's because the Lord says, my church is not hungry. God is bringing a hunger to this body. I've been asking God for it for 18 years. God's bringing a hunger into this body. And I want to thank everybody who was part of the 72-hour burn. In any way, shape, or form, I want to say thank you because I walked in this building and I felt tonight that the Lord was pleased. That's why I knew tonight God was going to show up in a powerful way. 
God's going to begin initiating change in your life in about four hours. He's already speaking to some about it. But the Lord says, when the clock strikes midnight, a shift is going to happen. The Lord said a shift is going to happen spiritually. A shift is going to happen, oh, hallelujah, glory. Woo! A shift is going to happen mentally, emotionally in your life. A shift is going to happen financially in your life. The Lord said a shift is about to happen politically all around us. And the Lord is saying, I'm going to bring you in the book of Haggai. Yes. Did I not say? And, I, and, and I'm going to bring you into Habakkuk. <laughs> the Lord said, did I not say that I will shake everything that can be shaken until only that that cannot be shaken remains? The Lord said, did I not say that I'm about to do something in your generation that if I spoke it, even now, you'd have a hard time believing it? The Lord said, this is going to be the year to take him at his word and speak his word and walk according to to his word. So guys, I want to encourage you, don't leave this house in the wee hours of the morning thinking you're going to go back to life the way it was. <laughs> the Lord says, I'm even shifting some this year vocationally. Amen. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. How many received the word of the Lord? Amen. 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 So we are so blessed tonight, number one. Amen. Because our bridegroom is in the house. Thank you, Jesus. Guys, we don't have the presence of the Lord. We don't have anything. And we're about to see a great divide between the churches that have the presence of the bridegroom and those that don't. Those that have revival and those that don't. This is going to be the year of the great and the terrible, guys. Joel's great and terrible. Daniel's great and terrible. Malachi's great and terrible. We're about to see the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Mm -hmm. Do you know that phrase great and terrible is used over a hundred times in the word? Yeah. 80 times in the Old Testament and 20 times in the New. God has been trying to prepare us for the great and the terrible. What's the great and the terrible? God is going to be doing mighty things while the enemy is working mightily at the same time. And the Lord says, we're going to need to keep our eyes on the prophetic storyline of the third heaven and not get caught up on the storyline of the earth. Amen. Come on. Yeah. Come on. And the Lord says, we're coming into the season now this year where there's going to be a people who know their God and they're going to do mighty exploits. Amen. There are Old Testament prophecies that generations have been waiting to see fulfillment of that we're about to see happen in our generation. That we're going to see beginning to happen in about... Three hours and 45 minutes. We're going to see Joel chapter 2 fulfilled. We're going to see Amos 9-11 fulfilled. We're going to see Malachi 3 and 4 fulfilled. There are prophecies that have been waiting for a Kairos moment. And the Lord says we're coming to that Kairos moment where they will be fulfilled. Hallelujah. The Lord said even now the prophets who spoke them that are in paradise have been crying out, when will these prophecies be fulfilled? And the Lord is saying the time is now. Amen. The time is now. Amen. I want to give you my theology in a bundle, but I just heard the Holy Spirit say, and he's the expert, by the way. Yes. He's the teacher. Okay. He said, you'll need no one to teach you because the Lord will teach you all things. The Lord is saying, Haggai is still waiting and petitioning the throne for the very prophecies that the Spirit of God spoke through him to be fulfilled in our generation. If you could see around the throne right now, you'd see Haggai, you'd see Malachi, you'd see Habakkuk, you'd see Joel, Joel, you'd see Daniel, you'd see others crying out and saying, Lord, is it time? Lord, is it time? Lord, is it time for these words to be fulfilled? Lord, is it time? Lord, is it time? Lord, is it time? And the Lord is saying, we're now coming into the time. For the prophecy awaits an appointed time. Watch for it. The Lord says we're coming in the appointed time of fulfilled prophecy. Get in alignment so you can lay hold of these shifts that are coming. How many received that in the Lord? Yes. All right. Josiah is probably going, okay, Pastor, I'm supposed to speak sometime tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. So I'm excited. How many love Josiah in this Woo! house? You know, Josiah was named after a king in the Old Testament that God brought 
revival through. He was put on the throne at a very young age, and God gave him a tender heart, and he brought revival to Israel. I believe that Josiah is going to live out his namesake, and he's going to be an apostolic revivalist in the Lord. How many received that? Ooh, hallelujah. Whoa, thank you, Lord. So let's just put a hand towards him right now on this New Year's Eve. Thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for Josiah. We thank you for Brother Joe Joe. Lord, we plead your blood over him right now. And Lord, I thank you. The very first time I ever saw him walk in the sanctuary, I saw your hand on his life and I saw your anointing. And Lord, I thank you, the young man that I met those couple of years ago. Lord, the young man that's before me right now is a completely different man. Lord, you spoke over King Saul and you said, and you will go to this place and you'll see a man carrying bread and wine and cheese and follow him and the spirit of prophecy will fall upon you and you will become a different man. Lord, I thank you that he is a different man. Lord, I thank you that he's standing on the precipice of destiny being fulfilled in his life. And Lord, I ask this night as he comes to the pulpit, I ask Holy Spirit that you will fill him with the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Lord, Isaiah chapter 11. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One understanding. Holy Spirit, I ask, may he get up here with one word, but may you take him over, Holy Spirit, and may you begin to speak a word through him that he has never studied on, that he's never practiced, that he's never written down. Lord, I ask God, may he go between his notes and the prophetic, his notes and the prophetic, and Lord, I ask that you'll give him a real peace, a real strength, and a real anointing to enjoy this Kairos moment in you where he's going to speak to this family that he belongs to. So, Lord, we just thank you for Brother Josiah. Lord, right now I cover his spirit, soul, and body in your blood. His mind, his will, his emotions in your blood. His conscious, subconscious, and unconscious mind in your blood. Lord Jesus. And, Lord, I ask right now, may an anointing of shalom come over him. Lord, may he study to show himself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the words of truth. And Lord, this night, even as he's in the pulpit, may there be a mighty shaft in this young man's life that we witness. Lord, may you open up a portal of glory right over top of him as he comes to this pulpit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. For he is the glorious one the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the great I am, the one who is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. And everybody said, Amen. 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 All right, Josiah, come on up, son. Yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. How many of us are thankful for our, our humble and our kind and our loving pastor? Amen. 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 We give the Lord the glory. So I am thankful for Pastor Andrew, not just for the wisdom that he shares, but also for the mentor. For his learning and the peace that he brings to this house, to the multitudes, for the decades 
that he has been a faithful servant of the Lord. And Lord, I just ask you to bless Pastor Andrew. We bless him in Jesus' name. And may the honor that you have bestowed upon him, that he would give that back to you, Lord, because you are the worthy one. Yes. You are the true Lamb of God. Yes. I will worship you before your throne. I will lift you on high. Jesus, we exalt your name. Yes. You are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And Lord, we thank you for this night. Yes. Give this night to you. We give this building to you. Yes. And we give this word, these people to you, Lord. Yes, Lord. I thank you for what you have done in my life. And I thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah. All right, am I up there? One second. All right, and let's let's thank George back there as well. Thank you, guys for singing. thank you, George, for hooking us all up. And also, thank you. I want to give a big shout out to uh, Sister Jean. Yeah. Woo! Anointed woman of God who leads us. There's a prophet's heart and also a shepherding heart. We honor you, Sister Jean, for all the sacrifices you have made. Yes. Because you give glory to the Lord. Hey, I'm gonna turn this up a little bit. Is this all right? Hold on. Is that good? Is that good? Is that good? Is that better? All right, good. All right, so let's get into it. Before I start, though, my dad informed me that uh, our brother Jim, he actually had his ear healed at that last song. Yeah! Yeah! Thank you, so I can hear him. <laughs> well, praise God, praise God. Seriously. Um, so actually, a, a couple weeks ago, during one of our prayer services, excuse me, uh, Sister Jean talked about how, you know, that, that scripture in Psalm 100 about entering his gates with thanksgiving, and it supports with praise and how this church has we do real well on entering his gates or yeah we do well on entering his gates um, and now it's time to enter his courts and so tonight's lesson is a little two-parter a little double parter and I just thank you everyone who is tuning in may God bless you and open up your ears to hear yes and any stone-hearted people, that you would be changed in an instant yes. in the name of Jesus. Yes. I thank, you. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for delivering them. I thank you for covering your daughters and your sons, your prophets and your apostles. And Lord, so we just pray over this word and I thank you. We give you all the glory and all the praise. Yes. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yes. All right. So let's dig into it. So like I said before, today's message is a little double parter, a two parter. And so the first part, we are going to be going into 1 Samuel chapter 24. So if you got your word, and I know you do. Yes. <laughs> refuge. It's the refuge. Got the word. <laughs> Come on, fellow, come back up here, Pastor. <laughs> All right, so we're going to 1 Samuel chapter 24. And we are always blessed by King David. And so when I 
kind of first started my transition back to the Lord, that is one thing I'm always thankful for for my father um, and my mother as well, is that they raised us in the word. And so even though I didn't like it, and even though probably half the time I wasn't completely focused, my dad would have us do Bible studies like once or twice a week after after it felt like almost every single meal but mm. <laughs> you know growing up I didn't realize how how important that was to me and so I thank you dad for, for doing that for me I really yeah. I know now mm-hmm. so God bless you <laughs> so without further ado we are going to start in First Samuel chapter 24 we're going to start verse 1 then we're going to go to about 15. It's going to be a long one, so bear with me. And I'm reading out of the ESV. So when Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here's the day in which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do with him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing as he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words, and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. And so I want to stop there, and I really, truly want to highlight a few verses in here. And the first one is 3 and 4, but let's look at verse 4. And the men said to David, here's the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. That's a tough one. Let's go ahead and go to the first slide. So, this prophecy isn't actually found in the Word. As far as, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. And when I was kind of reading and kind of going over, you know, what I was going to be talking about, this this really stuck out to me. Because I think there are times in our lives where people will speak things and will try to encourage you to take steps that aren't from God. Mm-hmm. And so these men who follow David, these are the the in, people who are in debt um, and all these problems, they're following David and it is up to David to lead these men and here is a prophecy that is not in the word but probably is true but they use this against David, they use this against King Saul to try and inflict harm upon Saul and it is out of context. Let's go to the next slide. So, the wilderness of En Gedi, let's talk about that. Good, perfect, thank you. So, the wilderness of En Gedi was about 3,500 acres wide, 3,500 acres long. All right, so it's a pretty big uh, uh, wilderness. And if you want to go to the next one, perfect, you're right on it. So, En Gedi is actually an oasis in the Judean desert, and it is near the Red Sea, or sorry, the Dead Sea. And if you go to the next slide, there are actually a few pictures. You got the pictures or no? No? It's a pretty okay. slide. Yeah, go back. Go back to those slides. I want to show you these pictures. So 
it's kind of hard to see. It's kind of hard to map out, but the wilderness is large, and there's the Dead Sea down at the bottom. And oh, thank you, George. And so, if you see how massive that site is, and can imagine uh, just how many caves, how many small caves are in this area. Like I said before, it's 3,500 acres, and it spans this entire region. And again, it's right along the Dead Sea. But if you go to the next one, it's actually, like I said before, an oasis. And so I always think it's cool of like how David kind of like compares himself to a to a sheep, and how you know the famous ver or the famous Psalm in 23 it talks about leading me beside still waters, and. You know, I always kind of like picture that this oasis, this is where God kind of led David. So let's go to the next slide. So in uh, verse, verse 3, it talks about, And he came to the sheepfolds by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. So actually, sheepfolds indicate that it was a very large cave. Okay, like so, so that picture before, there is all this barren wasteland, but there's all these caves, and some of them are even kind of like dug out more by shepherds. And so that is because they had to uh, shelter flocks of sheep because the sun would be so hot during the middle of the day sometimes that they would kind of carve out these caves to make them bigger and bigger and bigger, and they would bring in their sheep to these, these areas to kind of rest from the midday sun. And I actually like Song of Solomon, uh, 1 verse 7, it says, Tell me, O whom I love, where you feed your flock, where you make them rest at noon. And so it's kind of like that's a, a common thing or that's a common practice to know that um, your sheep, when it gets so hot out during the, the day, that these shepherds are going to provide shelter for them and put them in these caves. So anyways, David is here hiding out in these sheep folds in one of the caves. And how many of us know that in this 3,500 acre land, how specific was it that Saul went in to the exact same cave that nice. David was in with his men? Mm -hmm. Almost like a test, dare I say. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that he went in to the cave uh, to attend to his needs probably means that he was in there alone and his soldiers and bodyguards were most likely outside the cave waiting for him. And again, this is about 3,000 men. So you got David camped out in this cave and he's running from Saul, right? He's, he's been almost killed by Saul and so now he's on the run and he's in this cave to try and hide from Saul and get away. And so it, that's just really important. So I'm going to reread verses 3 through 7 really quick. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterwards, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing as he's the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words, this rebuke, and he did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. This dude doesn't know what just ha almost happened to him, right? Like, <laughs> just on the brink of death. But thank God we got David, who yes. we are trying to look out and who we are trying to be like, as well as Jesus. So if you go to the next slide, it highlights 1 Samuel 24, 4. And so I liked it. I was... I started to search around because I was, that part pointed, that stuck out to me. I was like, okay, I, I don't remember really hearing that, like that part about, you know, this is the day the Lord has given your enemies into your hand to do with what you want. 
it talks about, you know, in the Psalms, like preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And there are other things with your enemies, but it doesn't explicitly talk about and say that God would give David's enemies into his hands. And so what I, I was scouring around and trying to find, like, where exactly is this at? Um, and it's not there. It's not in the Word. So one, I was reading one article, and this one individual talked about, in light of David's response, one must come to one of several choices. Pretty much that, like, we can't find the exact spot, we can't find the exact place where it explicitly says, those words or that prophecy. So this individual said first, one might say this is a false prophecy, which it should be rejected. And they give uh, an example, and that's in 1 Kings 22. And second, this may be a prophecy related to someone, some enemy other than Saul, and wrongly applied to Saul by David's men. And third, this prophecy may be genuine and related to Saul but wrongly interpreted and applied by David's men. And they go on to say that the third option is probably the best. But again, this is not found in the Word. But as you see in your Word, are you guys' um, that, that is in quotations, right? <coughs> in anybody's Word? Look, at, look real quick at that prophecy. Right. So it's in, it's in quotations, and it could mean that either these men were making this up, or that this was a prophecy, like I said, maybe that God spoke to David on an individual basis, and then he later then told his friends. And it's interesting, Pastor Andrew, that you talk about, you know, you mentioned earlier about that bit. And one of my first teachings I ever did was on James 3, and it's about the power of the tongue. And it goes on to talk about a ship, you know, how a ship can be steered by such a small rudder. And a bit, you put a bit into a horse's mouth, and it you can take it wherever you go. And so I thank you, Lord, and I pray that whatever we speak in this year, that it is by you and only by you in the name of Jesus. We will not speak anything else. And that is really important. And here we see David's men. Again, we don't know if they are spirit-filled, but it's interesting that they usually are Gentiles and not uh, Jewish individuals. So... <coughs> Here we see that David's men wrongly apply this prophecy to try and confront, confound, to try and murder Saul, who was the Lord's anointed. And David listens to them at first. But he goes up to them, and instead of killing King Saul, he just cuts off a little bit of his robe. And so let's keep going with uh, verse 8. So it says, Afterward, David arose and went out to the cave and called after Saul, My lord, the king! And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your heart. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no longer treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you. You want my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you. But my hand shall not be against you. As a proverb of, of the ancient says, Out of the wicked comes wickedness. But my hand shall not be against you. Amen. And so what people say to you is important. How many of us know that all Logos word is Rhema word, but not all Rhema word is Logos word. Amen. That's a little trickster, huh? A little <laughs> tricky guy. <laughs> Jim, you like that one? <laughs> Meaning that God has prophecies that um, you might not find 
in the Bible. They will always go along with the Word of God, and they will always be established in that sense. Yes. But you might not find it word for word in the Bible. And that is that, that random word in which, bless you, Pastor, we are blessed when you kind of go on to that, that little dimension, if you will. I think it is. Yeah. It is a blessing. Mm -hmm. And so what you tell other people is so important. And it's also important what you tell, what you yourself, when you get from a pastor or, you know, apostle, a preacher, when you get from God himself to treasure these things in your heart, like Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so in the past, you know, pastor has talked about the difference between Joseph and Mary and how Joseph, as soon as he got that, that dream, that vision from the Lord, he just went off and he just like told his whole family immediately, which I completely understand, right? I probably would too. Um, but you being so excited, you get something from the Lord. But again, Mary, the mother of Jesus, treasured those things in her heart. Yes. Gabriel came to speak to her and he spoke the words of God. And a big deal, right? That she would be birthing Emmanuel and that he would establish his kingdom. And I thank you, Lord, that you will establish your kingdom and your reign. Yes. Let's go to the next slide. So, I think it's really important, David's heart as well, and his response. Because at first, he went in, he went to Saul, and whatever along the way, there was a point either before he went or right up until that point where he had decided he wasn't going to take Saul's life, right? Um, but so there was this little time, this little gap when the, his men told him to go kill Saul and wrongly, you know, interpreted this prophecy to try and encourage him and double down on this action to kill Saul because Saul was out. So I was making their lives miserable. They were following David, and David was having to go from cave to cave. He was fleeing all over the place, and he was running from Saul. And so these men were following David. And how many of us know that if David had just killed King Saul, then theoretically their problems would be gone because he would establish himself as king over Israel because that's what the Lord said, right? right. So there's this little bit of time where David makes and chooses in his heart not to go forward with that. And he chooses, I'm not going to do this. But he instead cuts off a piece of Saul's robe. And in David's mind, that was a heavy sin. Yeah. That was a big deal. So let's read that again. Afterward, David arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner, this is what gets him. But by the fact that the, I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As a proverb of the ancients says, out of the wicked come wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. So David's heart was very sensitive to God in that time and he at the time 
you know, did something small, maybe in our eyes, where he cut off a piece of Saul's robe, his garment. And in all reality, this might not be uh, a huge thing to, to, I guess, like make up for or to repay. For instance, Saul could just get another robe or have that repaid. But Saul was after David's life at this point, and Saul was trying to kill him. And Saul was David's confidant. He was the Lord's anointed, and David looked up to him. However, during this time, it shows the heart of David, how even though he had gone after David, he had tried to kill him, and now at this point he was searching him out in the desert with 3,000 men that David was still not going to put a hand to Saul. We know that killing Saul would have been quick and easy and maybe even justified, but it would have been wrong. David didn't point the finger at Saul. He did not fixate on Saul's sin and how he was against him and how he had betrayed him, his mentor, his role model, his king. But he did justify his own sin in the light of Saul's. He did not, excuse me. David only saw his own sin and responded from that. And that's what I hope to impress upon you all. You know, I'm reminded of the plank in your own eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> People will do us wrong, but it is not going to be our, it's not up to us to make it right. If we hold anything in our own hearts, that is what we need to deal with. And that's something I need to deal with. So Samantha, I apologize. I've not kept the purity at the forefront of our relationship. Is wrong. You know, it's interesting how I'm sorry. to me and to my family my future family who I anointed who are called and chosen by God my name is in the book of life Right? And we cleaned it up. And God kind of, when it happened, 
Um, I was like the first one to catch it. I came in here, kind of, kind of spoke to me, and I was just running by here. I just thought oh, I'll just use the bathroom real quick, and <laughs> and I came in, and it, this place, this whole place is flooded. I started freaking out, and so I immediately called my dad first. <laughs> Who then called pastor? I didn't know you would be a pastor. I apologize, but it was like about ten o'clock at night, and uh, so my dad did the right thing. He was a little bit more in his right mind. Just like ah, no big deal. And I think at first, pastor was like, oh, "Well, <laughs> what I say? I said I can grab a shop back, and we could just shop back this all up." And so that was the end of that first phone call. And then the uh, second phone call. I get from pastors like, yeah, I'm on my way. This is a, a bigger deal. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so it took, it took some hours. It took some manual labor and some man and woman power, some women and men power to, <laughs> to get this place cleaned up, <clears throat> at least somewhat decent. And, you know, some flooring had to be replaced. Mm -hmm. And so then the next time... We met up, which was a few few nights later. Uh, I wasn't even trying to be here, but God again just mm. it was that night I hung out with you, Geo, first, and then it was just we went caroling and saw Glenn. And God bless Glenn, love him. I'm glad I don't know if you're listening, but we love you yes. and uh, <laughs> we miss you. And so then we went out. Me, and my dad, and Pastor Andrew. We went out to get uh, new flooring. That flooring looks beautiful, huh? Let's give it off. And carpet got cleaned and everything, and really nice new duct tape or blue tape. I don't know if you guys can see this right now. <laughs> that is good stuff. Uh, so, anyways, while we were there at Menards, and right before we went in, I'm sitting in the back seat, and you know, my dad and Pastor Andrew are talking about Eagles, and. Uh, <laughs> I'm not even going to go into what they were talking about. <laughs> this is long, guys. All right, it's long. When you hang out with my dad and Pastor Andrew, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> but it's a blessing. And so, right before we're about to go into uh, Menards, Pastor Andrew kind of stops and impresses upon me. And so, 1 John 1 9. We know that one? Yeah. That's yeah. a tough one, huh? My heart. <laughs> My heart, what is it? <laughs> if we confess our sins, he is faithful and good. To forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all right. Oh, my God. Oh, amen. Oh, no, Lord, church. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And how many of us know that in the Word it doesn't say that he will forget your sins? But it says that he chooses to remember them no more. And so that is an act of God. That is a willing act of God that he is so holy yes. and mighty that he chooses to remember our sins no more. And instead, we have Jesus in place. And hallelujah, thank you God for your son. Yes. That he died on the cross for our sake, for my sake, and he rose again. And he is seated at the right hand of you, Lord. We love you. We thank you for that. So let's go to Act 2. Uh, can I have somebody turn off the, the main lights? We're not going to be, I don't want you guys to worry too much about the overhead. Um, but thank you, Gio. This is going to be more of listening, all right? Thank you. Whoa, can we turn on a little bit? <laughs> what? Sister, you're, yeah, can you turn on those ones? Thank you. All right, perfect. So, act two, it says, turn off the main light. All right. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Huh? And so, act two is about praising God. And I want to remind you all of the verse, what Sister Jean said, what she brings up 
We enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Yes. So I want to teach us or at least talk about how do we praise God. Why don't you go ahead and go to the first slide. So the first thing we're going to talk about is why do we praise and worship? Why do we do this? Well, Hebrews 13, 15 says, Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruits of lips that acknowledge his name. Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. That's not up there, but it's Hebrews 13, 15. So, why do we do it? Why do we praise and worship God? Well, the first thing, to make his name known among the nations what he has done. And that's in First Chronicles 16, 4. And there are, my dad loves that word, a myriad or just multiple reasons and ways to praise God. But I'm just going to touch on a few here. So in praising God, we extol his goodness to others. That means we, that's another word for praise, but it kind of like goes one step further than praise. It's like praise abundantly, praise extravagantly. And so we extol his goodness to others. We remind others of how good he is, and we remind ourselves. Excuse me. So praising the Lord also involves remembering the things he has done. Yeah. We got some uh, gray-haired saints in the room tonight. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah, that's right. And how many of us know that it doesn't matter how long or short your walk is, there are things that we can remember. And we can bless the Lord's name because he is good. Amen. And his mercy endures forever. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Terry, <laughs> for who you are, the man of faith that you are. We honor you. Amen. Very thankful for you. Yes. <laughs> so, the fourth one, we praise God for his miracles as well as his judgments. Right? His judgments. His righteous laws. Yes. He will be praised. Continuing on, praising the Lord also involves remembering his faithfulness and his promises. He's faithful to forgive yes. and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Right now, I want to take some time, just a little bit of time, to remember some promises that he has given you specifically. This place, 18 years, Pastor Andrew has been digging the soil. He has been preparing the ground. And hallelujah, I thank you that that is coming to fruition tonight, Lord. Yes. That even now you have begun to pluck out those that don't remain. And you will do these things for your righteousness and your name's sake. I thank you for Holly and your faithfulness to Pastor Andrew. How you have stood by his side. How you bless him. How you care for your family. And your hands are anointed. I thank you, Lord, for Pastor Andrew, Holly, children. You guys are a blessing as well. I love you. So last but not least, we praise the Lord because he will be praised from everlasting to everlasting. Yes. 
And that is one of the most important things to remember is that his name will be praised from everlasting to everlasting. What is the Dan, what is the verse about um, his name and his word? He is magnified. Psalm 138.3 He has magnified his word above all his name. Mm. Says in the King. Hallelujah. That's Jesus, right? The word. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, my dad came in the other night for prayer. And sometimes it's like there's such like a calm and peaceful presence in this area. And then you hear the doors open up and you hear keys jingling, and then you hear this roar of a voice, and (laughs) at times I have to, you know, you know what I gotta do. (laughs) And we know what Sister Jean does, and how she, you do, Sister Jean, you do such a good job of preparing this place. Thank you because it, it does make a difference. So let's go to the next slide. When do we praise and worship? Hey, you guys heard that? Was that a firework? I hope. <laughs> that was the shift. It was the shift. The shift is starting. Shift! You know what? And another thing, when you spoke that out, Pastor, I almost saw it when you were speaking that on Thursday. I was like, I saw you and I saw Terry behind you. And you know how, like, those old sailors or those old uh, uh, warships or the, what are they, pirate ships, when they would have to push the thing up, right? They would have they would be going around in a circle. And they, I don't know if it was like hoisting the flag or what it was, but they were doing something like that. What is that? Dropping anchor? What was anchor. that? Yeah, it was? Way the anchor. Wow. Yeah, so uh, that's what I saw. I saw you. Pastor Andrew, like when you were saying shit, and I saw almost like that, like this, this shit. big old rod shifting. Mm-hmm. And then here's Terry in the background not doing anything, but just sitting, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I did see you too, and I thought that was really, that was really impressive. That was really important. When you yell out shit, and Terry yells out get. Yeah. Like, shit, get, shit, get. Yeah. You know, that's a, Give a That's a dynamic duo right there, amen. Hallelujah. Terry? Yeah. Bombs away. Bombs <laughs> away. So David himself, let's get back on top of what we got here. Alright, we're almost done. We're, almost, we're wrapping it up, right? Let's <laughs> 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 so, so how many times would David praise the Lord? Seven times per day. So we talked about why we praise the Lord. How about when we praise the Lord? So that is in Psalm 119, verse 164. David said that he praises the Lord seven times a day. And also, speaking about midnight, speaking about almost three, two hours and 58 minutes from now, that in Psalm 119, verse 62, he says, At midnight I rise to give you thanks for your righteous laws. Psalm 119, verse 62. At midnight I rise to give you thanks for your righteous laws or decrees. And that's what we're going to do tonight. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. 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 John, you're staying up for that? Uh, one. <laughs> <laughs> well, praise God. We're blessed that you you guys are here tonight. Thank you for being here. Thanks for being here. You as well. We appreciate you guys. Uh, so, going on to the next point. We praise Him when it's easy and when it's hard. Yes. That's tough, huh? Yeah, amen. It is tough. Yeah. yeah amen. Do you guys... Uh, I was going to tell you this story, but I feel like God said not to. 
Amen. So David praised God after his son passed away. So after he committed that sin with Uriah and Bathsheba, that first child that was born, the Lord said he was going to take him. And so David prayed and he fasted. And I think for seven days he was praying and he was fasting and he was crying out to the Lord. Uh, and at the end of that time period, the child died. And his servants were talking among themselves. And David said, what are you guys talking about? And they were afraid because they saw David carrying on and crying over this child during that time that he was sick. And they said, well, he was in such distress then, what will he do now? And so David asked them, what were they talking about? And they informed him that the child was in fact dead. And so at that point, David got up, he washed himself, he cleaned himself says he put on lotions and he went and praised God. And I think there are times in our lives when we don't know why things happen the way they do. But we are called to praise God. When my mom was on her deathbed I tried to light, lighten, or I guess liven her spirits one day, and so I put on the song, uh, uh, Even When It Hurts, and in that song it talks about how, you know, we will praise God even when it hurts. Through all these tr pains, through all these trials, we will praise God. And I didn't exactly get the response I wanted from my mom, but I knew it ministered to her heart, and she said that was a beautiful song at the end of it, and I hope that someday, you know, we all need each other, and I hope that someday, when I am faced with all these trials and tribulations, I love what you say, Pastor, with David, when at that point in time where his men were talking about stoning him, death was at his door, that he probably dropped a rock and lifted up his hands. He found strength in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And knowing David, like he said, he probably praised God <coughs> in the midst of that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And I hope and I pray that we are all like that. Lord, that you grant us yes. your mercy during those times and your strength to praise you, especially when it is difficult. And I lift up your name. Yes, Lord. Hallowed be your name. Yes. Your kingdom come. Will be done. So lastly, King Saul praised God after God said that he rejected him as king. <clears throat> so can't remember what army or what war it was, but at one point David or Saul goes out and he is called to attack his enemies, and he is called to, I think they are the Amalekites. He's called to de totally destroy them. And that means like everything. Men, women, children, uh, animals, everything. Yeah. And instead he disobeys God and he takes back the best. Mm -hmm. He kills off everything else, but he takes back the best mm -hmm. uh, from the Amal Amalekites. And God sees that as complete sin because he didn't listen to what he told him to do. And at first, so he sent Samuel to him and King Saul comes up and says, oh, you know, I did for the Lord. God bless you. He's coming, riding high and mighty and says, God bless you. You know, here is, um, like we did, I did what you said. I did what the Lord said. And then Samuel responds with, what is this 
bleeding, bleating of sheep in my ears. Samuel knew exactly what Saul did, and he called Saul out on it. And then Saul relented, and Saul said, well, he expresses that he was afraid of his men, and so he didn't listen to the Lord and completely destroy everything, but he saved the best because he was afraid of his men. And then Samuel goes on to tell him that the Lord has rejected him as king. And after that, Saul asks if Samuel will come with him. And even though his heart isn't in necessarily the right place, because Saul asks if Samuel will come with him to praise the Lord of their God, the Lord his God, in front of everybody. But it's still an act of Saul that he chose to praise God after God probably delivered one of the heaviest blows to his life and said that he has rejected him as king. So, my final questions and thoughts. You know, we talk a lot about the glory of the Lord. So when the glory of the Lord comes, what will you say? When the glory of the Lord comes, what will you do? Anna? When God makes himself known to you, how will you respond? Have you prepared your heart? Because there have been many things that have been deposited into your heart. That God wants. To him who has been given, more will be given. And I thank you, Lord, that that is us here tonight. Yes. And we worship you and we honor you. You are Lord our God. You are Lord our strength. May your kingdom come. May your will be done here in this place. Yes. We thank you tonight, Lord. We honor your word. We honor your name. We honor your son. We will declare before the nations all to whom you send us to. We honor you, Lord, here in this place. Yes. King of kings and the Lord of lords, we give you the praise. Worthy is your name. Yes. We love you. We thank you. We honor you, Pastor, for the hard work you have done. It is not in vain. And on that glorious day, you will arise. The Lord will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you have a special place in God's heart. You always have. You always will. And as a man, I am honored. To see your humility, to see your gentle spirit, I love you, I cherish you, I honor you because you honor God.
Thank you, Sister Jean. For all you have done, for your sacrifices you made here in this house. We honor you as you honor our Lord Jesus. Pastor your sin. Thank you for your diligence and your faithfulness that you steward your gifts well. Thank you by Pastor Sai all these years. Lift up your voice as it is as beautiful as doves. given to you by the Lord. As you praise our Lord, worship the Almighty. stewards of what God has blessed you with. Hey guys. <laughs> God and you guys too. Thank you for being here. Wow. <laughs> Blessings. Encouragement. Prophet Jeffy, the first time that I met you, I'll tell you what. First time that I sat in your prophetic meeting, that felt so right. Watching you teach and being a part of that, I feel like it wouldn't have mattered. I'm glad that it was on that specific topic and that specific class, but I felt like it wouldn't have mattered what you have been, what you would have te taught. Because you had such a knowing and a grace and an authority when you teach and when you lead, that was so impactful to me and still is. We bless you and thank you for what you've done. How you've been here. We love the Lord and we praise Him. And so let's go the rest of this time. Praising God. We thank Him. We enter His gates with thanksgiving. Let's enter His courts with praise. Amen. Thank you, guys. Anybody blessed in this place tonight? Yes. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Brother Josiah's got the romantic lighting on. <laughs> it's the bride and the bridegroom in this place. Yes. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How many enjoyed that word? Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, does anybody have room for a little more word tonight? Amen. 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 Josiah, I was expecting two hours, but uh, <laughs> you know, you can kind of work up to that in the realm of the spirit, <laughs> right? <laughs> hallelujah. And let's do this. Let's turn the lights on. If I can have something hey, beautiful. Hallelujah. How about you? Thank you, Lord. Um, you know, I asked the Lord if he was going to give me a chance to release this word, and, and I kind of warned Josiah that once he kind of burned the pulpit down, I was probably going to come in and release some things that God had been speaking to me. Um, and so, have we got a little more room to receive tonight? Yeah. Amen? Okay. 
there's a couple things that God's really want, really put on my heart that I want to release to the group today. Because I think it's so important for us to not only consider what God was releasing through Josiah regarding the life of David and the importance of, of praise and worship, though that's preparatory. What he was teaching on was preparatory for what's coming here uh, in 2023, which is upon us in how long here, Brother Josiah? About uh, two hours and 40 minutes, okay. right? We're going to cross over, hallelujah. Guys, I really believe in 2023, we're going to see the glory of the Lord. Amen. I don't think you heard me. I think in 2023, we're going to see the glory of the Lord released over the church. Amen. Hallelujah. The word says that judgment begins with the house of God. And I believe as God cleans his house, and that's what God is doing right now, and that's what God is going to begin to do when the clock strikes midnight, is clean his house. But he's cleaning his house so that he can release his glory into his house. Amen. Because God isn't going to release his glory into a dirty house. Amen. God isn't going to release his glory into an unclean house. Amen. How many are hearing what the Lord is saying? Amen. I believe we're about to see the fulfillment of Habakkuk 2.14. And Habakkuk 2.14 says this, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. Let me read that again. It's Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. Isn't that a fascinating verse? That's a promise from God that I believe we're about to see fulfilled. That the entire earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. You know what the Lord's really promising there? That we are going to know his glory. Did I receive that? We're going to know his glory. The earth is going to know the glory of the Lord. Why are we going to know the glory of the Lord? Because we know the glorious one. And we've got to understand that. First comes intimacy, and then comes an outpouring of the glory. And the Lord is cleaning his church and the Lord is bringing his church to a deeper place of intimacy with him. And it's all preparation for us to be able to receive the outpour of his glory that's coming. And he's saying, my people, this is a promise, my people will know my glory. Why? Because they're going to know the glorious one. And we've got to understand that right now God is wanting to bring us into a knowing is we're about to cross over into 2023. God is bringing us into a deeper knowing of who he is. How many receive that in the Lord? That's why right now, if you feel the Lord pulling you into deeper intimacy with him, just asking you to spend more time with him in the secret place, being more persistent in calling your name and saying, spend time with me, is because the Lord wants to bring you into deeper realms of intimacy. And through those deeper realms of intimacy, he's going to pour out deeper realms of his glory into you than you've ever walked in before. The church has walked in a measure of the glory. But it's nothing compared to the glory that we're about to see poured out. And the Lord says, I'm going to pour out my glory, the knowledge of my glory over the earth, like the waters cover the seas. And the Lord was speaking to me as Josiah was preaching, and she kept speaking about the glory. So I kind of had my natural ears listening to Josiah and enjoying that word, but my spiritual ears were hearing the Lord talk about the glory. And really what Josiah was speaking on was bringing in the glory. Hallelujah. In honoring the Lord, right, and praise and worship, preparing the atmosphere for the glory of the Lord to come forth. But we've got to understand something. The word says judgment begins with the house of the Lord. And I heard the Lord speaking and saying the judgment and the cleaning of house of the church that's going on right now and is going to go on in greater portion as we get into January 1 in just a few hours. The Lord says it's so we can receive and be a receptacle of his glory. But the Lord said, as, as, as Josiah was speaking, that the Lord is setting up glory centers all over the earth. And when God said this, he really caught my attention. So I'm like, Lord, what, what is a glory center? How does this work? The Lord said he's raising up houses that he is going to be able to pour his glory out on. And then that glory is going to be released through those houses into the earth. 
There are going to be conduits that he's going to release his glory through. Hallelujah. And we're going to be one of those houses. I believe Pelly Road is going to be one of those houses. I'm decreeing, declaring that. My brother's church in Novo, in Wichita. They're going to be centers of glory. And what I saw was the glory of the Lord pouring down from the third heaven into these houses. But the glory of God wasn't being contained in the house. The house was just kind of facilitating the glory. And then the glory was going and flowing through those houses throughout the earth. How do you receive that in the Lord? And so I believe God is preparing this house to receive his glory. What does the Lord say in Haggai 2? He says the glory of the latter house is going to be so much greater than the glory of the former house. And let's be honest, if, if we're gauging the former house being the Acts chapter 2 church, how many know God did some glorious things? There were signs, there were wonders, there were miracles. God was moving in such a mighty way. But the Lord says, you know what? That was That's the former glory. That's the latter, the, the former reigns. God says, I'm about to pour out the greatest glory upon my house coming very soon. He says, the glory of the latter house will be so much greater than the glory of the former house. He's preparing us to be a house that he can pour out his glory through. We talked about Ezekiel 47 uh, in last Sunday's message. In Ezekiel 47, Ezekiel sees the water pouring out from under the thresholds of the house. Come on now. Why is it pouring out from underneath the threshold? Because the house is filled with the water. And the house can't contain it, so it's coming out from underneath the threshold. Where is it going? It's going throughout the earth. His glory is going to go throughout the earth through these glory centers that God is raising up. Is anybody excited about that word? I mean, God is just speaking to me, and I'm going, ooh, 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 ooh. That's really good stuff. But the Lord also said something to me that kind of, I'm not going to say it tempered my enthusiasm, but it really kind of grabbed a hold of my heart. The Lord said, and there will be a price to pay to walk in my glory. Yeah. He says, there will be a price to pay to walk in my glory. Josiah was talking about David. David had to pay the price. Mm -hmm. See, if he killed Saul that day, he would have kind of shortcutted his way to the throne. But that would have been a disaster because he wasn't ready yet. God seasoned him as Saul chased him all around the wilderness. God seasoned him. He took him from being a leader of sheep to being a leader of men so he could become a leader of a nation. He wasn't ready at the moment he caught Saul in the cave. He wasn't ready at that point. How many know that God is preparing us and the preparation for the glory is as important as the outpour? Amen. And the Lord is saying, if we aren't willing to be prepared, he can't trust us with his glory. Because he will see, he says, I will share my glory with no other. He's only going to pour his glory out on houses that are willing to give him the glory and are not going to try to control his glory. He's going to pour his glory out on houses that say, Lord, the glory is yours. This revival is yours. This move is yours. And we're hungry and thirsty for you, Jesus. Let us be the conduits that you're going to flow through and we'll give you all the glory. We're so in love with you, Lord Jesus. We're not going to get in the way. But Lord, use us. Use us. You're a spirit being and yet use bodies of flesh to move through. God, use us. We are willing. But the Lord says the cost will be great to flow in his glory. But guys, at the end of the age, none of us, as we stand before the Lord, are going to think, man, I wish I'd spent more time pursuing this earthly pursuit. Man, I wish I'd spent more time working on this hobby in my life. What we're going to think when we stand before the Lord is simply this. Man, I wish I'd spent more time with Jesus. So when I was standing before him right now, I'd know him even more than I know him in this moment. Right? When the books are opened. I think we've got to understand that right now, the Lord is saying to us, the cost to flow in the glory is going to be high. 
but he's the most high. The cost to flow in the glory of glory is great, but he's greater. And God is preparing us to be conduits of his glory. How many are receiving this? And guys, when you begin to become, and, and I don't know how much of this Lord's going to let me speak this actually in the notes. But the Lord is saying this tonight. When we begin to flow in the glory, our life is no longer our own. And I'm going to be honest, guys, we're kind of in a place right now, a lot of us, where we kind of pick and choose. And the Lord says, I want to bring you to a place where you don't pick and choose anymore. I want to bring you to a place where your life is completely surrendered to me. Because didn't I say, you are bought with a price, your life is no longer your own. The Lord says, if we're going to flow in the glory, we're going to have to live lives that are no longer our own. How many receive that in the Lord? Amen. If we're going to, John's already got his hand out. Let me just put that the notes away because God's just going in a completely different direction. The Lord said, if we're going to flow in the glory, our lives can no longer be our own. Because when we're conduits that the Lord's glory flows through, he's going to say to us, okay, go over here. Go over there. Go release my glory over here. I want you to go to Walmart over here. Well, Lord, I, I, I'm closer to, to, you know, the Alpine Walmart. Yeah, I'm sending you to Owen Center. The Lord is, is going to begin to mess with your schedule when we really yeah. begin to walk in the glory. Yeah. Yeah. And your lives are no longer going to be your own, and there's going to be a price to pay. Well, what's the price to pay for flowing in the glory? Well, we've got to understand this. You don't control the flow of the glory. The Lord controls you when we come to this deeper place of surrender. And the Lord says, what's going to happen is we're going to go into Walmart and the glory is going to begin to flow and you can't turn the glory on and you can't turn it off. You're not in control of the glory. That's why he won't give his glory to those he can't trust. You will be a conduit of his glory. He's got to release his glory through his bride the way that he has designed it. We've got to understand that. So what's going to happen is you're going to walk in Walmart and the glory of God's going to start flowing through you. You know what? Some people are going to love you and some people are going to hate you. And you can't turn it on and you can't turn it off. And we're going to understand what Paul said when he said, we are the fragrance of Christ. To one, we're the fragrance of life and to the other, we're the stench of death. Who is equal to such a task? And the Lord is reminding me that, that, that Paul spoke that having a firm grasp of Roman culture because he was a Roman citizen. And what Rome would do would be he, Rome would go out and conquer people. And when they conquered people, they would march these conquered people into Rome. And there would be this huge parade. And as this huge parade went on, and they would have the conquered people marching in front and the victorious army behind marching into Rome and this big parade and everybody's cheering and everybody's laughing and, and, and everybody is just enjoying the moment of Rome's great conquering, right, that's going on. They would release rose petals from the higher areas of the city and the rose petals would come down during these parades. And as the rose petals came down, the fragrance of the rose would be released. To one group in that parade, it was the fragrance of life, the victorious army. To the rest of the group, it was the stench of death because they'd been conquered and been defeated. Same rose petals, two completely different reactions. Same glory, two completely different reactions. And guys, right now, the Lord is preparing us to be his fragrance. He's preparing us to release his glory through. Because how is the earth going to be filled with the glory of the Lord? The knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. It's going to happen as he releases his glory through us. Through those who know the glorious one. And when the glory starts flowing through you, your entire life is going to be turned upside down, the Lord was telling me. <laughs> You're no longer in control. Because God is going to control you, and I mean that in a good way. The Lord wants to direct you in everything, right? Trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, acknowledge Him in everything, and He will direct your paths. 
The Lord is trying to bring us to a place of total surrender so he can release his glory through us. Tonight, there was an atmosphere of the glory of the Lord in this house during worship. As we were singing a song that was right out of the book of Revelation, I felt the glory of the Lord in the room. When the glory of the Lord comes in the room, we have to steward that glory. We have to cultivate that glory. Because as quickly as the glory of the Lord comes in the room, if flesh rises up, it's as quick as the glory of the Lord will leave the room. And all the enemy needs is one little hole to get in through for the glory that God's releasing in the room to go just that quickly. Just that quickly. And so what God wants to teach us as we're entering into 2023 is how to lose our lives so that we can find it in Him. Surrender to Him and go into a deeper place of intimacy as He prepares us to be glory bearers. Because as I listen in to what God is releasing from His throne, I keep hearing Him talk about the glory, the glory, the glory, the glory, the glory. He's wanting to release His glory on the earth. He's wanting to release it through us what does the word say about the bride of Christ? She will be without spot and without wrinkle. She will be a glorious bride. She will be a glorious bride. Let me ask you a question. Is the bride right now in our generation glorious? Is she without spot and without wrinkle? That's why the Lord is bringing judgment to the house of God. That's why the Lord is cleansing his house. So we will be a bride without spot and wrinkle that he can release his glory through. Is anybody receiving this word? I've watched Catherine Coleman. God periodically has me just YouTube her and watch her ministering from back in the, the 50s and the 60s. And I was watching her one time, and I even played a clip for our, our, our group, our, our intercessory group, where she stands up in front of the group and she's ministering and she starts weeping. And she says, the anointing doesn't come cheap. And she's speaking in the midst of the age of the anointing. And guys, God is moving us out of the age of the anointing and into the age of the glory. There are two different things. We've seen in the last decades in the church an outpouring of the Lord's anointing. And the anointing flows through us into others. The anointing touches others. But when the glory comes, God does the ministry. We had our brother and Jim in the back tonight say that in the very last song that we were singing tonight, glory to the Lamb, glory to the Lamb, all glory to the Lamb, glory to the Lamb. He said during that last song, his ear was healed. Nobody touched him. Nobody anointed him with oil. Nobody went over with a word of knowledge saying, the Lord told me your ear needs healing. The glory of God touched him and he was healed. See, when we get the word of knowledge, we go over to Jim because Holy Spirit says his ear needs to be healed. And we grab some folks and get some oil and pray over him. There's a healing anointing that's flowing. The Lord says, I'm shifting you from the anointing to the glory. But he says, then you'll walk in a glorious anointing. Is anybody catching this? We've got to understand this. The shifting that's going on right now in the church. And part of the church will lay hold of the shift in line with what God's doing. And the vast majority of the church will not. And we're about to see a big distinction beginning very soon in this new year of the churches that walk in the glory and the churches that don't. 
We're about to see this. God's releasing his word right now to prepare us. This is a forerunner word. Because when this begins to happen, the Spirit of God is going to say, do you think it not strange? Because I do nothing without revealing it first to my servants, the prophets. And God has been speaking this word to us. And he wants to make sure tonight before we shift, before we go into a time of prayer, he wants to make sure we get this word. Because this is very, very important for us. What God is about to do is bigger than us. Amen. And we can't get in the way of it. You don't want to get in the way of this. Because there's such a stark contrast between the anointing and the glory that once you get a taste of the outpouring of the glory, nothing else, nothing else is going to satisfy you. I've watched John Kirkpatrick after Brownsville teaching on that revival and I've heard him say over and over and over again, I want to experience the glory again. Yeah. Like we did in 95 on Mother's Day. I want to experience the glory again. You know why? Because once he got a taste of the glory, he never wanted to walk any other way except in the glory. The glory will ruin you. Mm -hmm. And we've got to understand the glory is an atmosphere. And the glory is also the weight of God. The glory is the Shekinah, which is the glory atmosphere that comes in the room. Now, I felt the Shekinah of the Lord come in this room tonight. Anybody else? Yeah. And in that Shekinah glory atmosphere of God is when Jim's ear was healed. Okay? Nobody laid a hand on him. The Lord laid a hand on him. The glory cloud came in, guys. There's a moment as we were worshiping where I'm, I almost couldn't tell were we in the third heaven or were we on earth. Mm -hmm. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. We got to that place of tension in the spirit where we were either going to press deeper and we were going to be in the throne room. Anybody feel that? Mm -hmm. Or we were going to back off and we were going to miss it. There are moments in the glory, Kairos moments in the glory where God is doing something and we have to lay hold of that shift that's going on. There are invitations in the glory where the Lord says, come higher. Yes. We pressed in at that point and God took us to a higher level of glory. But there's levels of glory. Amen. There's not a level called glory. There's <laughs> levels, there's dimensions of the glory. And let me tell you what God wants to teach us through the Holy Spirit. And learning from the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit, receiving the teaching of the Holy Spirit on the glory is going to be so important in the days to come. Because the Holy Spirit wants to teach us how to be the glorious bride without spot and without wrinkle. And let me tell you what the Lord says is about to happen. The Lord says in our services, there's going to be moments where we can feel the glory of the Lord come in the room and a divine invitation from God to press in harder at that moment and go into a higher level of the glory. We've got a choice. Because at that moment, are we going to be so hungry for Jesus that we press in harder? Or are we going to be so caught up in thinking about the cares of the world? And we kind of go, oh, man, we push so hard already. We push so hard already. Really? Pushing harder? See, the Lord wants to ruin us in his glory. So when we get to those moments where we can feel like we can lay hold of the shift, that there's no question in our hearts. This is what I want. Because this is what I've always wanted. See, what you're going to find is we work in the anointing, but we rest in the glory. And when the glory comes, I feel at home more than I do any other place in the earth. You know why? We came from the glory. Amen. What did David say? Lord, you saw my unformed body when you knit me together in the secret place before you put me in my mother's womb. Tell me he wasn't talking about being in the glory before placed in our mother's wombs. Amen. So what you're going to find is there's a place in the glory where you feel more alive than you ever do outside of the glory. And God's going to ruin us
to the point where every single time we get together, whether it's a prayer meeting, whether you're going into the secret place for your, your quiet time, whether it's going down the road listening to praise and worship and spending time with the Lord or here in a service, then we are going to just have to have the glory. And when that happens, we're going to understand what the Lord was saying when he said, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and I will dwell amongst you. Because where did the Lord dwell in Israel? He dwelled in the Holy of Holies. Yes. Above the mercy seat of the ark was where his glory dwelled. Is anybody catching this? That's where his glory dwelled. Now we've got to understand Jesus is crucified. He's on the cross and his blood is flowing and his blood is flowing down on the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. Meaning what? That place of access into the glory is ours through his blood. Hallelujah. It's our legal right. But we have to hunger for the glory. And we have to be willing to pay the price to walk in the glory. And guys, the glory isn't going to come to the churches that have an hour service. The glory is going to come for those who linger. It's going to come for those who linger. Because you linger if you hunger and you thirst. See, I'm convinced that God is about to transform the church into something the world has never seen. And he's giving us an invitation to be a part of it. There's an irresistible invitation given to this house and remnant houses throughout the earth. An irresistible invitation to be houses of his glory. He wants to shift the church from being a house of religion yeah. to the house that contains his glory. And then what's going to happen is, remember what happens with Moses when he's up on the mountain? What goes on with his face once he comes off the mountain? The word says, if we go back to the King James, his countenance radiated the glory. Do you know we're the only being that God has created on the earth that has a countenance? A countenance is here to here and here to here. Dogs don't have a countenance. Fish don't have a countenance. Birds don't have a countenance. See, we behold him face to face. Countenance to countenance. And the glory flows from the bridegroom to the bride. And the Lord says, Isaiah 60, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the what of the Lord? Glory. The glory of the Lord does what? Shines around, Shines around about you. I think God wants to give us a revelation tonight. Don't see yourself when you read that verse, standing here and the glory of the Lord shines all around you. The glory of the Lord shines about you. Because you behold the glorious one. Is anybody hearing this? Why did the, the glory of the Lord come forth from Moses' countenance? Because he beheld the glorious one. It didn't come from his hands. That's the anointing. See, this is the shift. We're so used to the anointing and how the anointing has flowed. But the Lord says, I'm shifting from the anointing to the glory. And then a glorious anointing will come. Are you catching this? It's a completely different atmosphere that God wants to have in his church. Do you know the glory? I believe the glory is why the Acts chapter 2 church was so attractive because they were so in love with Jesus that the glory of the Lord flowed through them. Is anybody catching that? Okay, we, we've got to understand this. Peter was transformed when he had a glory encounter with the Lord. We've got to understand that. And what does the Lord say the Lord's heart for us is? To go from height to height and you know what glory to glory is? Going through the glory dimensions of God. Ever increasing dimensions of his glory. And we're not going to go from height to height, glory to glory to glory. We're going to go from height to height, glory to glory. Is anybody catching this? But we can't do it playing church. 
We can't do it with two songs, an offering, three songs, and a 45-minute message, and you're out of time for the kickoff. God says, I want to transform the way that my church is manifest in the earth. And that's where the prototype word comes from, that God is speaking to us. We will be a prototype, and people will come here from all over asking, how does this work? Mm -hmm. And we're going to show them because the glory comes. That's how it works. Kilpatrick in, in, in ooh, hallelujah, Brownsville said they didn't know what time during the service the glory was going to come. He said the glory of God could show up during pre-service prayer. The glory of God could show up in praise and worship. The glory of God could show up during the word. The glory of God could show up at the very end. He said he never knew. See, you don't control the glory. The glory belongs to the Lord, and he'll share his glory with no other, but he'll pour it out on those who will give him the glory. Are we catching this? He said there'd be services at Brownsville where it just felt dead. The Lord wasn't even in the house through praise and worship. Then he'd get up to speak, and the glory would come in the room. You know what they learned at Brownsville? You know what they learned at Toronto? You know what I believe they learned at Azusa Street? Was how to prepare the house to receive the glory. Now the Lord's not going to let me do a teaching on, on shifting the atmosphere. Uh, I believe that's going to come next Sunday. But talking about how to, how to prepare, how to shift the atmosphere for the presence, for the glory... <laughs> But what they said at Brownsville was 4.5 million people came to Brownsville during that revival. 4.5 million people from all over the world. You know why? Because the glory is there. He said they had two weeks. Father's Day 1995, the glory hits. They had two weeks until people started showing up from all over the world. Two weeks. How did word spread that quickly? See, I believe there's people in churches all over the earth that are hungry for the glory. And some of them are in dead churches. And the some of them, the Lord is saying, come out from among them. But grab a hold of this. He will pull them out to immerse them in the glory at a church that's willing to be a glory bearer in church so he can send them back in to bring the glory. See, sometimes God takes you out of something to change you so he can send you back in with a different perspective. And there's going to be people that show up here and get immersed in the glory and spend time with us to go back to churches that they told us the name of the church would be like, you're going, you're going back where? Glory's not there. Yeah, God told me to go back. Why? Because they're going to bring the glory with them. And as they do that, the house has to decide whether or not they want the glory. Not every house will. Because the glory disrupts. The glory changes the schedule. The glory has a higher requirement. The glory messes you up. Patrick said for the first two months of the Brownsville revival, every single service, he was flat on his back before the Lord. Yeah. He'd just go out and they'd just put him in a corner because he couldn't do anything. But the Lord, but he said the, the Lord touched him about two months in and strengthened him and anointed him yeah. so that he could stand and minister yeah. in the glory. And he said what he found was at Brownsville, he would step down off the altar at the end of the service and he learned when he put his foot down from the final step onto the ground of the sanctuary, he had to brace his foot because the glory came like a flood down the aisle. And if he didn't place, didn't set his foot, he would get carried away by the wave of the glory that was coming through. And the Lord says, every revival that we've seen up to this point in history was like a man going to the spigot and opening it up just a little bit 
and a few drops came out. The Lord says in this final end times revival, he's going to open up a spigot full blast. Yes. Yes. This will cost us everything. Because your life will no longer be your own. Is anybody catching this? Your schedule no, will no longer be your own. This is a realm we've never walked in before. But you know what the Lord is saying to the church this night? He's saying, if you want to see me do something, that you've never seen me do before, then you've got to be willing to do things that you've never been willing to do before. There's a lot of people in this room that are a whole lot more radical than what you realize. There's some people in this room that God is just waiting to pour out His glory over you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yeah. Mm. 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 Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. Because you're going to walk through Walmart and there's going to be a wake of the glory of the Lord that's going to come through you. Is anybody hearing this? Yes. So we've got to understand, like the boat going through the water, creating the wake. That's what it's going to be like, the Lord says. Whoa. It's going to be like people walking, like Peter walking down the street and a shadow is healing people. Tell me that wasn't the glory. Well, the anointing is he wasn't touching them. It was the glory. And the glory was touching them. Oh. 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 Mm. Oh. How many want this in the Lord? Yes. Hallelujah. Then we've got to press deeper. See, this is what we need to understand. The Lord wants to teach us corporately and individually how to cultivate the presence of God and to bring in the glory. How many, how many receive this? Amen. And next Sunday, I believe the Lord's going to allow me to talk on shifting the atmosphere and preparing the atmosphere for His glory. See, we've got to understand something. Atmosphere matters. Atmosphere affects you. Atmosphere affects what's going on all around you. Atmosphere is incredibly important. And the Lord wants to teach us how to cultivate an atmosphere of his presence. How many receive this? And that atmosphere is going to bring in the glory. Tonight, the glory began to flow because there was an atmosphere in the house of hunger and thirst. People came with anticipation and expectation. And at that moment, everybody pressed in and the glory came in the room. Just a drop of the glory came in the room. Wasn't it wonderful? Yes. I mean, anybody ever want to do regular church again? No. Let's not. Let's church. Hallelujah. See, we've got to understand. Hmm. What God's wanting to do. What God is offering this house. To be a house that he pours his glory into. And if we can really begin to grasp that tonight, because I want to believe, I, 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 I just believe in the Lord that he's going to keep pouring his glory out more and more. That we're about to see the great and the terrible. We're about to see difficult things going on very quickly in 2023. Spiritually, politically, economically, socially, Medically, technology, we're going to see some things going on that are very dark and difficult. But at the same time, the glory of the Lord is going to be shining. Nations will be drawn to your light, the Lord says. Isaiah 60. Whew. How many receive that in the Lord? He's preparing us. And I say that we say yes to this invitation from the Lord. Yes. Yes. 
What do you say? Amen. I say yes to this invitation from the Lord. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. We're about to see that outpouring oh, of the glory of the Lord come. Oh, oh, hallelujah. Oh, Lord Jesus, I just ask even now, because Lord, when we talk about you, you show up in the room. And Lord, tonight we've been talking about the glory. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that your glory will come into this room in a deeper level and realm than we've ever known before. Hallelujah. Lord, teach us how to cultivate an atmosphere <coughs> that becomes part of our DNA it establishes a culture of the glory of this house. Lord, we just ask for that tonight. Oh, that you'd be, oh, begin to, oh, oh, release your glory into this house, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just put your hands up to receive. Thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, you said the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, like the waters cover the seas. Lord, we ask that you pour out your glory over this house, Lord God, that this house would be a volcano of your glory. Lord, that spews your glory all over this region, Lord. Lord, we ask that for Pelly Road tonight also, Lord. But Lord, preparation comes corporately and individually. And Lord, as our hands are lifted up before you right now, Lord, cleanse these hands. Cleanse these hearts. Lord, if there's anything in us that would hold the glory back, yes. Lord, cleanse it away. Yes. Lord, if there's anything in this house that would hinder your glory, Lord, cleanse it away. Yes. Lord, Ezekiel talks about silver purified in the fire seven times. Lord, we ask that you would send the fire and may the fire purge out everything that's not of you and prepare this house to walk in your glory. Lord, you said you would be our God and we would be your people and you would dwell amongst us. Lord, we are hungry for that tonight. We are thirsty for that tonight. We desire you, Lord Jesus, more than anyone or anything else. We desire you, and we love you, Lord. Lord, you call us your friends, John 15. Lord, show us your glory, and pour your glory out through us upon the earth to the nations, Lord. May the nations see your glory through us. Lord, help us be your bride without spot and without wrinkle. A glorious bride. Lord, that's what we want to be. Oh. Lord, may you send the fire of your glory and your glory fire over this house. How many are willing to receive? Lord, send the fire of your glory and the glory of your fire over this house. Glory, 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 glory. Lord, release your glory over this house. And Lord Jesus, I thank you. There's people in this room that are going to take your glory all over the earth, Lord God. Lord, release your glory. Lord, may you release angels into this room, Lord of hosts, that carry the glory to be released upon your bride. Lord, may you release your angels. Are not your angels ministers of fire? Lord, release your angels in this room. Lord, may glory be upon their wings. And may the glory be released 
as their wings come into this room. Lord, you said for those who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise up over you with healing in his wings and his beams and his rays, and you will leap like calves released from the stall. Malachi 4. Can you feel the Lord pouring glory into this room again? See, we've got to stop thinking that glory only comes one way. During praise, during worship. No, God can release His glory any time that there's a hunger. Any time that there's a willingness, a desire. Any time there's surrender, God can release His glory. Lord, release Your glory. Lord, you said there's a whole new way to minister that you want to teach us. Holy Spirit, teach us. We want to See the glory of the glorious one that we love. Lord, release your glory. Lord, release your glory over your people. The glory of the Lord. Lord, even as Ken and Rhonda are here tonight, may you release your glory over them to be released at Valley Road Christian Fellowship. If you've got the gift of tongues, let's just use that gift before the Lord. Lord Jesus, we desire you no matter what the cost. We want to know you no matter what the cost. We want to walk in your glory no matter what the cost. Glory of the Lord, come! Glory of the Lord, come! Come, Lord Jesus, come! Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, release your glory. Lord, release your glory. Lord, rise up over us with healing glory in your wings, Lord. Release your glory. Release your glory. Release your glory, Lord. The glory that's going to touch the earth. Lord, begin to release your glory in this house tonight. May the earth be covered with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord like the waters cover the seas. Lord, may this house be filled with the glory, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Go and pour it out like a holy volcano over this region, Lord. Lord, over the apostolic state of Illinois, over our nation, Israel, and the earth, Lord. Glory bearers. I just speak the glory bearer anointing over you right now. I just speak the glory bearer anointing over you right now. I just speak the glory bearer anointing over you right now. Guys, there are angels in this room right now. There's a release that's going on in this room right now. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would take this church to the next dimension. Lord, not a couple of us, not a, a remnant of us, but this whole house. 
Lord, take us to the next dimension in you, Lord. Lord, open up the dimensions to us that Adam lost when he ate of the apple. Lord, open up the realms of glory. For we will go from height to height to glory to glory. You said that, Lord. And your word will not return void. Lord, take us from height to height and glory to glory. <coughs> Lord, I thank you that we with unveiled faces... Oh, we'll look into your glory. Lord, unveil our faces tonight so we can see your glory. And may we become your glory fire bride. Your glory fire. Whoa, bride. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. Fire bride anointing. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. Whew. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, release your anointing. Lord, release your anointing. Lord, release your anointing. glory in this room. I declare the Lord is taking you in the deeper realms of his glory. Height to height and glory to glory. Hind sweet for high places. Hey! Lord, release your glory. Lord, release your glory. Who's getting warm in here? Ooh. Lord, release your glory. Lord, release your glory. Oh, Lord, release your glory. Oh, Lord, release your glory. Lord, release your glory. Lord, release your glory. Lord, release your glory. Thank you, Lord. Lord, release your glory. Thank you, Lord. Lord, release your glory. Thank you, Lord, yeah. Lord, we ask that you would release your Shekinah glory in this room. May you shift the atmosphere to the atmosphere of your glory. And Lord, may your kavod, your weighty glory come into the room, Lord. Lord, we want greater than what you poured out in Azusa Street. Greater than Toronto. Greater than Brownsville. Greater than Hebrides. Lord, we ask that you would pour out your weighty glory over this house tonight. Lord, may you pour out your glory over the young people in this room. Over Hannah, Aaron, Zach, and Pat, and our precious daughter that's in this room, Lord God. May you pour out your glory. Lord, may you pour out your glory this night. Lord, over our, our 20-somethings in this room, Lord God Almighty. Lord, may you pour out your glory over our 30-somethings in this room, Lord. Lord, over those in their 40s and 50s. Lord, may you pour out your glory over the gray-haired saints that are in this room. And may the latter glory be so much greater than the former glory. Lord, release your glory. Yes, Lord. Lord, release your glory. Yes, Lord. Lord, release your glory. Oh, release your glory, Lord. Oh, release your glory. Oh, release your glory, Lord. Oh, Lord. release your glory, Lord. Oh, release your glory, Lord. Oh, release your glory, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Lord, release your glory. Oh, 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 release your glory. Oh, Lord, release your glory over the McGuire family. Lord, release your glory over the Trip family. Lord, release your glory over every family that's in this room. The glory. Oh, of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. Lord, release your glory. Oh, release your glory, Lord. Lord, teach us through the power of the Holy Spirit how to cultivate an atmosphere that you can pour your glory out into. Lord, teach us how to be vessels that you can pour your glory into. Lord, we want to walk in holiness, Lord God. Lord, we want to be set apart for you. Lord, may you release an anointing to walk in the holiness of God amongst our group, Lord. Lord, release that anointing. Lord, you said, bless the pure in heart for they will see God. Lord, release that pure in heart anointing in this room. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we just bless your name. George, would you just play in the background that song that we just really enjoyed in praise and worship tonight? Just brought in the glory. It was uh, second to the last, I believe. Open the scroll. Open the scroll, yes. Open the scrolls. Lord Jesus, this night is yours. This night is yours, Lord. I just feel like God wants us to linger here, right? 